mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, and but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the Lord. I want to start, uh, actually, before I preach, um, reciting, I, I guess actually paraphrasing a, a poem, a short poem by uh, Wendell Berry, who is an essayist and a poet and a farmer. He's getting quite old at this point, I believe, but he says something that's called a warning to my readers, and I would say a warning to my listeners. It's a, it goes something like this. I should have copied it off, but amongst the many other things I was doing, I forgot. It's um, something like, do not think me eloquent because I speak on behalf of eloquence or of graceful because I speak of the grace that holds the world together. I am a man, crude of speech, prone to fits of anger. If I have spoken well, if anything, it is a wonder. So, again, that's paraphrased, but I, I don't say that to be self-deprecating per se, but just to remind every congregation I ever preach to is preachers are in the midst of nuance and struggles and, and joys and concerns just like everyone. And we have our, our, our good points and our bad points. So. Let's go into the story. I'm afraid this is going to fall, so I'm going to put it down here. Um, I recognize that this Sunday we is kind of unique because you have two different independent stories being read this morning, each, each worthy of its own sermon. But I'm taking these two stories because they speak to something that I felt would be good to uh, speak about this morning. Um, they represent to me two models for getting our needs met. Um, the one model, the story of the blind beggar, is a model of self-advocacy, self not self-sufficiency, it's actually just the opposite, self-advocacy. That's the calling out part of the sermon title. And the other is 
the noticing part. And that's the pay attention part of the title. And that comes from the Zacchaeus story. Both are very important elements, I think, in being Christian community together. It's worth noting, I think, that these two stories come within a context of Jesus and the disciples journeying toward Jerusalem. Now, traditionally, the church um, starts to liturgically and, and narratively speaking uh, begin it with uh, the first Sunday of, of Lent of looking at Jesus and the disciples making their way toward Jerusalem, finally culminating in Easter. But so we're a couple of weeks ahead, but that's okay. Um, so we can imagine this crowd as they're walking toward Jerusalem, Jesus and his disciples. We can imagine the, 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 the crowd sort of, as they're going through small villages and towns, sort of tagging along in this little cadre of group of people making their way to Jerusalem together. It conjures in, to my mind, maybe the scene from the movie Gandhi, which came out a couple of decades now, but um, where true, the true story where Gandhi is uh, making a march to the Indian Ocean where to protest uh, attacks on the uh, salt that the British occupiers had um, had imposed on the people, and as, as Gandhi and his, his small group of organizers are going along through the villages, at the, the crowds keep coming, and there's this long parade that make it to the ocean together as they, as they move through, from village to village. And I imagine something like that, only maybe for sure on a smaller scale with Jesus. But here they are, they're moving toward Jerusalem, Passover's coming up. It is the Jewish celebration of liberation. And you know it's got to be fraught with political unrest by the Roman um, forces in the, in the land. So here's Jesus leading this parade of followers along the road to Jerusalem, and along the way is this blind beggar. Now, what makes this guy interesting to me is his persistence, right? Here is this insignificant, socially speaking, insignificant nobody who upon learning this notorious, compelling, radical rabbi is passing by and he yells out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy, right? And the followers of Jesus rebuke this man and basically tell him, shut up, you don't matter. Don't bother him. This just, it's, you're embarrassing us. This just makes the man more determined, and he shouts out even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And what's he got to lose, I guess? Jesus hears the man and orders him to be brought to him. Then Jesus asks the great question, and it's the same question, interestingly enough, that we, I raised up and pointed out uh, when uh, Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee and sees Andrew. And the question is, what do you want? And uh, it's a simple, profound question. And, and the man knows exactly what he wants. He says, I want to see. And just like that, boom, Jesus pronounces, receive your sight. So what I get out of this, the blind beggar, and he's not given a name, just the man born blind, is the perfect example to me of self-advocacy. He is an important model for those of us living, trying to live in congregational life together. And I want to tell you several ways he models this. He's not shy. We can say that. He's not shy. Notice he doesn't give in to the external voices of those around him telling him he's not important. His needs aren't important. And in fact, he, like all of us, no doubt has an inner voice too that might be saying you're not important, but he's not listening to that either because he knows he does matter. His needs are important. His situation is worthy of attention. So lesson number one, you are worthy. You are worthy. Advocate for yourself. A friend of mine 
was telling me about one of his kids who was kind of re-litigating some of the parenting that happened. This child is now in the 40s. And this person had wanted to go out for a particular sport that wasn't really conducive for uh, females at the time. And um, he didn't think so anyway. Um, and he apologized that, that he didn't allow that um, to, child to explore that a little bit. Uh, but then he got to thinking and he came back later and he said, he said, he said to, to his daughter, he said, you know, I know you're only 14, but you could have advocated for yourself a little bit and maybe that would have made a difference. But mind you, what 14 year old, some 14 year olds are really good at advocating for themselves and some <laughs> of them are. Um, number two, the blind beggar is willing to be vulnerable. Whenever we speak out publicly or even privately regarding our needs, we are making ourselves vulnerable. We are announcing, I need help. I can't do this by myself. I am weak. I have limitations. I have needs that can't be met alone. And that's hard for us to do or as sometimes happens in the church, we put everybody else's needs first and foremost and forget about our own self-care. So second lesson for me that comes out of this is community can't really happen if we're not willing to admit our limitations and express our needs. We, make, when we, ma we need to make ourselves vulnerable in doing this. Um, and as the sainted Brene Brown says, and some of you may be familiar with this person. She's done a lot of TED Talks and books and stuff. She writes about this stuff. She says, there cannot be authentic community without the willingness to be vulnerable. True community comes when we stop worrying so much about others' judgments or opinions and allow ourselves to be open about our needs and our limitations. Number three, the blind man is clear about what he wants. Sim simple and straight. When asked what he wants, he says, I want to see. So, might be a third lesson here, and that would be know yourself. Spend time and examine your heart and mind. Imagine, perhaps, if you will, Jesus coming to you and asking, what do you want? And then, how, then ask yourself, how would I respond to that question in any given moment? What do I want? So that's the first story. Let's move into the second story, the famous story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man. We can't think, I can't think of Zacchaeus' story without my Sunday school story song coming. Y'all know that? Raise your hands. Okay. I don't know if it's a generational thing. Zacchaeus was the wee little man. And anyway, I had the hand motions, right? The wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Savior passed away, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come, you shake your fingers, you come down for going to your house today. <laughs> I'll tell you, theological stories from Sunday school have an impact. It says nowhere in the scriptures that he wagged his finger and scolded him like a school mom. But that's the image. Although as an adult, I think more like maybe he, he was walking by, perhaps he had a twinkle in his eye and he heard about this man and he's laughing and he's telling him to get out of the tree and come, I'm gonna go to your house. And he's just delighted by it because he's blowing this guy away. We don't know. Because again, scripture is, doesn't have a lot of adjectives. Um, so we have to fill in with our imagination and that's okay. That's, part of delighting in the scriptures, I would say. Um, but let me get to the heart of this matter. What, now here is a story of another way we ought to try and be, I think, in congregational life. The story tells us we ought to pay attention. This is the pay attention part. Here is a man, Zacchaeus, who, we, 
who we might assume to be a bit shy. He's also a tax collector for the Roman occupiers, so he is seen by his fellow Israelites as a collaborator, collaborator and traitor. So right there, he's already someone who is an outsider with presumably few friends. We don't know, maybe he had some friends, but he's somewhat, he's definitely an outsider. We do know by his actions that he is intrigued by this regional celebrity rabbi. Zacchaeus, we might say, is a seeker. Something is missing from his life, and so he climbs up the tree to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Something worth noting here, and that is this. Jesus notices Zacchaeus. And let's take this as a model also for church. Jesus pays attention. Jesus could have easily simply noticed the man and walked on, or not even noticed at all, but he didn't. He noticed. So lesson one, in the, in the church, we pay attention to those on the margins or the shy ones or the plain not speaking for themselves ones, those who are not necessarily self-advocators. Being mindful is important in the church, and it's everyone's job to do that. Some are naturals at this. Those are the people the pastor relies upon because no one person, not even the pastor, can know everything or everyone uh, who is needing some attention. And believe me, it is very helpful when someone comes up and informs me about someone who might appreciate some pastoral attention. With that being said, I will also say that the vast majority of care goes on informally and naturally amongst the gathered saints, y'all. So between the pastor, between structures like deacons or congregational care teams, and, but most importantly, the broad caring sensitivity of everyone, real needs and support happen. Second lesson is Jesus interjects himself into Zacchaeus's life. Jesus is proactive, not passive. Without waiting to be invited, Jesus simply says, I'm coming over, let's do coffee, or some Middle Eastern equivalent. We in the church can do that. We can notice those in our midst, pay attention to uh, noticing those in our midst. We also pay attention to our mind and heart, our guts, our, our intuition, the location of the Spirit's voice within and act accordingly. Now, I don't want you to think that just because I'm inviting you out for coffee that I'm thinking there is an urgent need in your life. Sometimes that might be the case, but not always. Sometimes it's just what we do. We check in and we share. We, my, my wife who grew up in Hawaii, she's, She's what's called Howley, which is uh, a white, an Anglo person. But she did grow up in Hawaii, and she knows the, the lingo. She says, that's, that's called talk story. You go and talk story. Because that's just the basic element of friendship and community. Now, if we're reaching out to someone because we think there's some kind of struggle or crisis, we get that sense, or we know something, we, we have to be careful. We maybe should ask ourselves, am I making assumptions about this person? We do that all the time. Or uh, another question we might ask is, is, am I perhaps pushing into somebody's space where I'm not welcome? As to the first question, am I making some assumptions? I think we just need to carry those hunches lightly. We don't assume what's going on in someone's life, but rather we interject ourselves towards somebody, make a gesture towards someone with a very open mind. In other words, we knock on the door, but we allow the other to invite us in. As to the second question, am I invading someone's privacy? We need to trust that that person will let us know. They may not say it outright, but they will instead communicate by declining our overture or postponing 
or whatever. And I, I find that in most cases, even if the person declines the overture of caring, just the gesture of noticing is enough. Now, just as a side note, because it doesn't relate specifically to this morning's theme, but it would be a remiss in the Zacchaeus story if I didn't point out the ending. We don't know how the conversation was between these two men, Jesus and Zacchaeus, but something significant happened. Transformation happened. In this instance, Zacchaeus repents. He demonstrates this by pledging publicly to make restitution for any harms he has caused. We might call Zacchaeus the patron saint of restitution, reparations, if you will, which uh, that could be another topic for a sermon some other time. But here's the thing that does relate to our theme this morning. When we make a caring gesture, you never know what kind of effect it has. What small miracle or blessing you may have given birth to. What if Jesus hadn't responded to the blind beggar, we might ask? What if Jesus hadn't noticed the wee man Zacchaeus? We'll never know because Jesus did respond and Jesus did notice. Do you have stories perhaps of some small seemingly insignificant act that you did only later to discover that it had made an important impact on somebody's life? I bet you do. In fact, I almost assure, I can assure you that you do. You may not remember them, you may not have been given notice about them, but you have. And I know there are a lot of gestures you have made that you will never know. Uh, like I said, you will never know, and that's okay. But now and then we hear of the impact we have made. There was a, we, I have a house, and actually a house and a house, the, the small house we live in is next to another small house we rent out. And I was, the renter at the time, years ago, had asked if it was okay to invite her significant person to move in with her. And, and, and she was young and all and had a, had a son. And I, I just said, I just, sat with her for a minute and said, have you, is he good for you? Have you thought about this? Is, you know, just caused her for a moment to reflect. And we allowed this new renter to, to be a part of the house. And, um, and in fact, uh, a couple of years later, I did their wedding and they're thriving and doing well decades later and it's all great. But I didn't know at the time, she told me later, that little thing, that little fatherly talk or whatever, I don't know what it was, uh, had a big impact on her. It really meant a lot. I was like, oh, wow, thanks. Thanks for telling me. Was it, the little stories like that you have too, I bet. Conversely, we've all had moments where we didn't act and wish, wish we had or at least wondered if we should have. None of us bat a thousand. And just because we missed an opportunity, opportunities come through other angels besides you and me all the time. God is sending opportunities and new chances every day. The gospel is being worked out through many, many, many actions by many, many, many people. God works through people despite themselves, unaware oftentimes that they are even acting on behalf of God. That's the mystery of God at work in the world. And we don't even see it we don't see how our thoughts, our actions, and our words affect the world, but we know they do. And praise be to God for that. Believing that is enough. So I'll conclude. May one prayer we pray as we rise from our beds in the morning be, God, make me an instrument of your peace, even in the ways I am totally unaware of, but keep me alert by your spirit. Speak to my heart and mind as I interact with my world today. And then may our prayer at the end of the day be, God of mystery, I trust and pray that whatever I did with my words and actions today, that there may have been some seeds of hope, redemption, and joy planted. 
thank you that you work through me despite myself it's an honor and as i rely upon your forgiveness and love for what i haven't done help me to let it go now and to sleep well and oh if it be your will i look forward to having another crack at it tomorrow amen and amen <laughs>